morning, good morning, and happy Sunday. Welcome to the dawn, and welcome to a nocturnal bird of prey, the Varro's eagle owl that we've been attracted to his or her position by an enormous amount of birds shouting their defiance in the morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Steve, joined by Paul on camera, and we are delighted and excited to have you with us this morning, as it is going to be a very interesting day we feel <coughs> yesterday we had excuse me we had two leopards in a sighting Unzatini joined last night on the dam cam and coming out of camp this morning there's tracks of three leopards up and down around our entrance so we've come back to the site of Shadulu's kill last night there uh, lion audio test Tess is following up on lions that have been calling. They've been calling defiantly. There are cats everywhere. Two hyenas are now lying at Shadulu's kill. There is no sign of Shadulu. We were following up on the bird calls here because we thought maybe Shadulu was seen, but then I saw this giant eagle owl. Now, everybody, we would love to hear from you this morning. Remember, we are live and interactive. Your questions do matter to us. You can scan the QR code or go through to the website where you can submit your questions there. Questions, comments, stories, bring it on. It is a lovely, cool morning this morning. <laughs> it's already 20, 27 degrees Celsius, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't think it's quite at that temperature at this moment, but it is not far off. So for those of you joining us this morning and didn't join the show last night, happy harvest moon happy full moon harvest moon in pisces to all of you may you harvest great joy great abundance in your lives it is going to be a cat kind of morning um, we are going to be trying to figure out this puzzle piece of leopards we didn't hear any calling last night doesn't mean it didn't happen the leopard calling when I'm in my room and the fan is on is impossible to hear. But lions are close and calling. It's always good when they're calling. So I do apologize for my sudden outburst on the radio there. But if Tess is trying to follow up on them and she's driving, she can't hear the calling, I can quickly say, switch off. Then she can triangulate a better position. But now, this giant eagle owl is the center of our attention this morning he is in or she is in this lovely jackalberry tree in the drainage line and the go air birds are quiet yeah copy that uh, my leopard walk through camp so so we had a male leopard walking through our camp this morning. We don't know who he was. Now those tracks are heading north. He was also outside our camp with a female. Um, was it Unzantini? Was it Tlalamba? Was it Shadulu? We don't know. But the giant eagle owl is the center of attention this morning. And the Koa birds, the Forks of Drongos, are not very happy that he's here. There's a golden tail woodpecker calling. And you see the Varro's eagle owl, or giant eagle owl. Oh, hello, Ribbon. Goodness gracious, before we send you over to the weather forecast this morning, we just had a, a brief glimpse of Ribbon. She's also going to go to the kill. We're going to be joined by three hyenas. Let's get it quickly. We can tell it's Ribbon because she has no tail. Hello, Ribber Rob. Are you going to go and interact with the other two hyenas there? It could be interesting. We will follow her to the kill. And uh, while we do so, let's send you over to have a look at what the weather looks like across all properties.
rather spectacular sunrise. It never ceases to amaze. <clears throat> and not only do we have a beautiful sunrise, it's also a little surprise to our rights. And the surprise is not me. You all know me. My name is Chris. And with me on camera ops is Panda. But to our right, there's a whole group of dogger boys lying down. So what do we do? Do we look at the sunrise? Or do we look at the, bu the buffalo? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine... I see another one to the front, ten. A nice big group of, of Dugger boys. Buffalo bulls. Mostly old fellows in this group. One or two younger bulls, but... I just want to reposition myself slightly here. It's a very awkward position. All right, so now I've got a reposition. Anyway, guys, so I'm going to do that again. My name is Chris. Panda is with me on camera ops. And our plan today is to just drive around a bit. We're going to look for areas to look for game. Well, we've got the buffalo already. And then we'll do short little walks. That's sort of like spider system that I use where I find an area, you know, fan out in one direction, 100 meters or so, come back do it again and do a bit of a what we call a spider web around pridelands in order to see if we can't find any tracks or anything that we can interpret there's not only animals there's quite a few things happening there's a couple of trees that are starting to produce flowers some of the early trees that, that flowers like the knob thorn trees the red bush willows i see starting to to create flower buds the russet bush willows the weeping boor beans. So if we do get that, we'll take a look at it as well. Right. I also want to investigate whether this is not perhaps the actual large herd of buffalo. We might just be on the edge. So I'm going to inspect and see if it's not perhaps the herd. But let's go over to Tessa to say good morning. Okay, we have started our morning in style. <laughs> We've been following Lion Audio. Listen, they're calling. And we found, I think this is Blondie lying down. And just up on the other side of the hill, if you follow the line, you'll see a shape. There's the other one right at the top, further up, G. Got him. Go ahead. Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself, everybody. My name is Tess. I'm going to be your guide on safari here for the morning with some lions. Behind the camera is Gert. Best way to start the morning. Best way. We've been following the audio since midnight. We heard them calling each other, one from west, one from east, and they have been calling and calling and calling. And finally, as we pulled up here, we found the tracks. And there we go. We're on Biffles of Cut Line. And we're just to the east of Gallego shortcut at the moment. This one, the other one looks closer to Gauri cut line. Yeah, Johan, sorry, I'm trying to respond. We've got one male just to the east of Gallego shortcut on Biffles of cut line. One male looks like around Gauri cut line coming towards us. Both males have visual of each other and our vocal. Oh, he's up again. There we go. Let's move a bit forward. I'm hoping that our signal is going to hold. We'll just avoid the next step. We'll avoid it. There's two lions. We are Vogas. Listen.
Uh, leopard lover, we love that cat's energy for the weekend as well. I don't know how we all got so lucky, but we are definitely loving it on this side. I can't believe that we've been so lucky, not just with leopards, but with lions as well. And it looks like there are tracks of other lions too. It's not just the two evokers. There's definitely a pride around as well. I'm going to stop here for now. We can still see the other male right at the top of the hill. Maybe he'll call back. It's very special to see male lions moving towards each other. So he's just behind those thickets right at the top. He looked like he turned towards us. So perhaps they're going to meet somewhere in the middle and maybe the pride is somewhere in the middle. But look at this, lions on a mission. And there's lovely elephant tracks that he's walking on top of. Oh, wowee. Okay. As he reaches the top there, let's reposition. I'm hoping our signal is going to hold. I think it will. It's a little dip. We're going to give it a try because we have to lions moving and calling it's the best thing we'll see if we can get a little bit closer to him he's looking quite good he's moving pretty freely it looks like the other lions have been walking east along the cut line too oh, this is just too cool stop here for a bit until we can find a clear patch to quickly go around him what I'm loving is you can see as he's walking you can see little bits of dust coming out from this very sandy surface he's making a little bit of a mini dust storm you can also hear there's another vehicle coming to join us let's just watch him walk a little bit further and then we'll try and get in front of him hopefully get in the middle of the two how good would that be Right, let's move. Pretty boy. Thank you to you and your brother for calling and calling and calling. It's been a very exciting evening. All right, let's see what we can do. We'll try and get in between the two of them and then we might have one coming from each side. And we uh, now have our sun that's rise quite a bit. So let's just uh, enjoy this as a peaceful moment. Listen out to the birds calling and just enjoy the glow of the sun on your skin. Hear that very sharp drilling sound, which is a crested bobbit in the distance. And soon after this, we'll probably leave these buffaloes and head out to see if we can't find any cat tracks, perhaps leopard or lion.
or even the dogs. Try and get to do that before it gets too hot because we're in for a hot one today. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. We are just repositioning. Blondie's coming towards us. Oh no, please don't cut all the way into the bush. <laughs> so we've got Mohawk somewhere behind us and Blondie here in front of us. Hopefully he's going to keep coming. He's been kind of veering off the road a little bit. He's been scent marking and then he comes back on and starts calling for his brother. Let's see. Oh. Okay, if he's cutting in north, east, then Mohawk must be here. So we could actually, we could see Mohawk on the boundary standing here behind us and then he started coming down. Maybe he's cut in somewhere here and they're going to meet in the middle of this drainage line. For now we're going to wait and see. Ah, there I can see Blondie, he's cutting in. Still calling and calling and calling. Let's go up the cut line and see if we can. Ha! Lions to start the morning with brilliant timing. The rest of the Pride's tracks kind of continued east, so along the cut line. All right, that vehicle's going to follow Blondie. Let's see if we can catch up with Mohawk quickly. Oh, oh this is so much fun. Lions calling to start the morning. See tracks here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Keisha is the best way to start a morning on a little safari with lions, I'm telling you. Sunday morning safari, lion success. Okay, I can see his tracks going up the road with the rest of the pride. So there's other lions here. It's not just the two of them. So he was standing kind of up here. If Blondie's cut in, maybe Mohawk is cut in as well. It's a hyena tracks too. So we've been using a combination of tracks and audio to find them because we could hear them calling from the different spots. Right, this is about where he was standing, facing that way. Come on, Mohawk. JJ, lion calls might intimidate leopards and get them to move. Uh, definitely is a possibility. There's his tracks there. Standing and then cutting onto the left. So yes, lion calls can definitely intimidate leopards, but they don't really have too much to worry about because they can tell the distance based on how loud that lion call is. So if it's very close by, a leopard will definitely be much more alert and start kind of moving a little bit more maybe going up the trees but particularly for an instance like Shidulu on the kill if there were lions close by they might try and get up that tree and then she's got to get higher up than they can get to. Okay so I think you may have cut in somewhere here. Can't see any tracks cutting in but I can definitely see tracks still going that way. Oh is that him there in the road? 
Yes, it is. <laughs> Best morning. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm going to leave it for a while. Let's go and see where he's going. So he didn't turn in. He's left Blondie to go and relax in the bush somewhere. And he's going, I'm, I'm going to follow the pride. Thank you. Bye. Bye, as Cedric would say. I could hear Cedric in my head going boom shakalaka. Epic start to the morning. Epic. He is just casually walking up the road. Okay, we're getting closer to Gauri Cut Line now. So I think we're gonna have to stop somewhere here and show you him walking on the other side, but I know for 100 percent certainty with 100% certainty that we're not going to have signal going through this next dip. So we're going to watch him from here for a bit and then we're going to head across. There he is. Big boy. So worth it. Okay, so he's definitely moving east towards the area of Biffles Hook Dam. So for now, we're going to catch up with him, go through this dip and we'll send you over to Steve. Hmm, I believe we've already said good morning. Hello, everybody. Well, one female leopard came from uh, the dam up towards quarantine. That was uh, Nsele from last night. A third hyena joined the kill underneath Shadulu's tree. No Shadulu there. We've got Swazi, we've got a Ribbon and somebody else i don't know we'll go back shortly i'm just trying to figure out if shadulu she's probably still there she's just she's so full that there's no need for her to be up the tree she will go back up again but then a male leopard walked through our camp and headed north there's just so much action going on that male leopard was around yesterday in this area I don't know who it is. Young male, not huge tracks. So we're just doing a few loops around the block just to just to see that nothing else has happened while we wait for Shadulu to climb back up a tree or at least reveal herself. There's still a bit of meat there, so I don't think she'll abandon it. And uh, the tracks of the male and the other female didn't go there. They stayed around our sort of camp. So maybe there was some interaction <coughs> with Nzuntini and Salamba last night. Did I say Nsele just now? I didn't mean to say Nsele. If I did, please forgive me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Unzuntini. And Tlalamba probably had some interaction around our camp. Tlalamba loves to go into our camp. Just loves it. Loves to come and hang out. Told you the story once. I was sitting on my, in my room, my desk, the sliding door just here, and the curtain was closed. And I heard a strange noise outside. I opened the curtain. Tlalamba was right here next to me on my porch. Just a bit of glass between me and her. And she was growling at a hyena that was obviously checking out. It was probably Swazi because he just loves to come into camp. She, she loves to come to camp. That was quite a, quite a special moment. I've also got tracks of Tlalamba on my yoga mat the year before last. <laughs> Sandy, wet paw prints. Very special. Alistair, it's not something that they want to do. Um, I've never seen females fight to the death. I've seen them. I've seen a male kill a female before. Uh, you know, the, the injuries that can be sustained through the fighting could lead to death, most certainly. But it's not something that they're attempting to do. They 
try and dominate each other physically and through posturing and noise before um, fighting. And if they do fight, it can be incredibly violent. It can be incredibly violent, but they don't want to because um, either either individual has the potential to kill the other one. So they do avoid major conflicts as much as possible. And that's the purpose of, of territories. Establish your territory, put down your boundaries, and uh, obey the boundaries. Everything will be good. Yesterday, Shadulu went and drank inside Tlalamba's territory, and Tlalamba wasn't happy about that. She's like, this is my spot. Very close to their boundary, I'm sure, where the kill was. So it becomes quite contestable when it's on on such a whimsical, in a whimsical space, in a sort of grey area. Um, and as you saw yesterday in Port, they're incredibly aggressive towards each other. Seems aggressive. But did they physically beat each other up? It was more noise and posturing than physicality. Sign up to be an explorer and watch Wild Earth totally ad-free. Yep, you heard me right. No ads at all. And not only this, but by becoming an explorer, you help us on our mission to conserve wildlife. You spread awareness about these creatures and you contribute to helping our planet. Enjoy Wild Earth as it is intended, naturally, uninterrupted, and totally advert-free. Sign up today for this and so much more from Wild Earth. So we have managed to catch up with the furthest away male lion that we saw all the way across the cut line. He hasn't given us the easiest view, let me tell you, but we eventually found a spot where we can see his face and he is looking absolutely beautiful. He's also eaten a lot. When he was standing, his belly, I felt like was about to touch the ground. But it also made me think I'm not 100% convinced that this is Mohawk. Although, I could be wrong, so please, if you can, let me know. Do you think this is Mohawk or do you think this is the S8 male? He just looked very big and in 
very smooth condition if that makes sense not as many um, not as many scars and things especially on his body compared to Mohawk Copy that, yeah, you can't miss me, I'm on the road. Okay, so it is good to know that everybody's a little confused as to who these male lions are. The first one we initially thought was uh, Dark Mane from a distance because of the way it was limping on the front right. But when we got closer, we realized the mane was too full to be Dark Mane. So that narrowed it down to probably Blondie. But then, sitting with this one and watching him move, I don't know, I'm not convinced that this is Mohawk. I'm really not. But he is beautiful, look at that face. Still sniffing into the wind. I'm wondering where the rest of the pride is, because they were also moving east. They probably cut north just into Biffleshook as well. And I think the males have been following because there's been food based on the size of this one's belly. Oh, he's up. Going east. East is good. East is not north. If he keeps going north, he's going to disappear. Let's see. Oh, he's coming back to the cut line. Yes. Oh, he's coming back. Yay. Oh, look at that mane and that belly. Right, let's do this. Jordan, this animal is now back on the cut line, mobile east. Oh, that sun is quite bright, but he is quite beautiful. I will take it. Okay. Let's see where you decide to go before we decide where to go. He keeps sniffing the ground. Ah, oh, Laura Cam, I'm so happy that I'm not the only one who gets goosebumps from sightings like this. We've had such an exceptional weekend. I really don't know how we got so lucky. Oh, look at the dust blowing, look at those massive paws. He is just beautiful right let's not let him get too far <laughs> this is so good <sighs> now maybe you'll get a nice big view of you know the body and the face and his shape when he's moving because i think that's what threw me off from a distance figuring that was blondie i thought this must be mohawk they're calling each other Seeing him in the full image, close up of him walking, I, I feel like it might not be my walk. Okay, let's see where he goes. We are going to stop up here and try and loop around him soon. He is still on quite a mission going east, so we'll see what happens for now though. Hopefully he finds the pride, and speaking of pride, I think it's time to head over to Chris in Pridelands. I thought we'll get back to a little bit of Prideland stuff, bushwalk stuff, tracks. And when we had the dogs a couple of days ago, and I thought we'll just, uh, when we did explain the dog tracks versus hyena tracks, they can be similar. So we have hyena footprint here. For those who have not seen some of my previous tracking segments as well as some of our newer viewers, let's just quickly analyze the hyena track. So a typical Pawed animals, so you've got what you refer to as a intermediate pad, and then one, two, three, four toes. Now with hyena, first thing we look at, we can see the visible claws there, very visible blunt claws. Then the toes are almost spaced, almost right against each other, and especially those ones on the side 
are kidney shaped. But you can see there's not a lot of space. It's like all cramped like a puzzle together. And then very importantly, this intermediate pad, it's got those sort of almost like two lobed back. It's a very asymmetrical pad. Now with wild dogs, what you'll have a typical dog track. So the pad will be more symmetrical and more triangular shape, flat at the back. Then the the two outer toes are spaced a bit forward. And then the two front toes are together in front with a lot more space in the track itself. And you will have visible claws as well as it is a dog. And the thing is with true dogs, you can divide the track into perfect thirds. So the front toes, the middle toes and the pad. So you can see there, one, two, three can't really do it you can see there's an overlap in the pad there with the toes doesn't really work not a lot of space and then very typically the kidney shaped toe all right so this would be what I probably think is a left front foot and how we can determine that is by using our fingers we can use our hand so basically oh, that's gonna be a difficult one you can see my fingers fit very easy on the toes there, my left hand, but if I use my right hand, I need to adjust it. So the same as us, you'll have the middle toe, which would be the most furthest forward, and then they systematically sort of taper down. You can see you get that sort of shape very similar to my fingers. And that's how we know. How we know it's a front foot, we can look at the dimensions of the track. So we can actually measure it. If we look at the length and the width, very, very similar. It's a much more round track, whereas the hind foot will be more oval, the length will be more than double the width. And in the case of Ahina, the hind foot will be substantially smaller in size as opposed to the front foot. I can show an example of both here. Right, here we can clearly see. Again, here is a front foot that will be a right front foot and there's the hind foot just look at the difference in size front versus a back foot there and if we measure that back foot yet again we will see the difference in dimensions you can see there's the overall length you see how much wider it is compared to the width there's the width see that more than double almost double whereas front foot look at the overall length almost similar to the width and then size very very important right we're gonna find another spot we're gonna go back to the car drive around maybe go check around leopard dam and then we might get off and look for some small things in the bush again but uh, let's go over to Steve and his elephants Well, elephants in the morning. We were just surrounded again by a small herd here, feeling very blessed. Across she goes. The rest of the family. There's elephants up ahead as well. This young boy here. Oh, there's a young girl. Hiding. Hiding in the bushes. Here comes one of the mamas now. Very relaxed. 
She will come to as close to us as she sees fit. Eyes are very soft. Feeding. Before you came to us, we had a few babies in the open walking past us. She's having a thought though. She's like, hmm, what's this voice I hear? He's alert. Hello, Mama. Yes, I see you. I see you. Welcome back everyone and apologies for that break in transmission bringing you live broadcasts from the depths of the African wilderness is sometimes has its challenges but we are with more elephants they are all over the place at the moment we thought to go and check Treehouse Dam just see if anything's going on there and then we slowly make our way back to the area of Shadulu and her very well eaten Nyala carcass. Orange breasted bush shrikes calling in the background. Right, so we're back on the vehicle. I'm just going to drive towards Leopard Dam and, and we'll just get out there and look for some tracks. If there's anything that we can try and find. It's a technique that I often use with my safari guests as well. Um, so sometimes we just do a go and drive. If I have a tracker, then we keep driving. Um, often I might not have a tracker with me or the tracker might be busy uh, tracking something. And then what we do to assist this wheel drive little sections we get out of the car I, I'm a big fan of getting guests out of the car as much as possible even if it's to look at a flower or 
if there's something on a tree, much like what I do here. You know, sometimes we do a full-on bushwalk. Um, and that way, if you combine the two like that, you can get best of both wor worlds. You have the mobility that the vehicle provides to cover larger areas, but also the facility to get out and look at stuff that's not seen from the roads. It might be, oh, there's a nice hill or something, let's go and climb that. Or we might see a flower in the distance. Or there might be a giraffe, maybe 100 meters in. And as we don't off-road for things like giraffe, perfect opportunity, get out of the car and approach. Giraffes are relatively comfortable with people uh, in most areas, uh, as long as you don't approach them too directly. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to be driving around, select an area, just do a little loop. And keep doing that until we either find something of interest or perhaps something to track. That will be good. That will be good. And then while I'm driving, obviously, I am looking for tracks. We've got a nice sun at an angle, so tracks should be relatively visible. There's a lot of dust on the roads. It always helps to see tracks a lot more easier. This little boy is not bothered at all by our presence. Loving the food hidden in amongst the bushes. Elephants, elephants everywhere. Elephant energy, everybody. There's something amazing about it. Something very special. Being close to them in a vehicle can really change one's perspective. Encountering them on foot has a whole other concept, a whole other movement within one's soul. I have managed to introduce a number of people over the years to elephants on foot and every single time it has changed their lives. And I was on trail recently with some people who've now become very good friends and took them on trail in Pufuri and we had some incredible elephant energy and I just received a message from them that they are going to be selling their home in San Francisco and moving to South Africa. And that was through experiencing these naughty fellows. <laughs> the animal energy and especially the elephant energy does things to the soul. Hmm. So Rich and Claudine, if you are watching, these elephants say good morning. food for the soul everybody 100% food for the soul
wilderness experiences in places like the Kruger where you have the potential of big game has enormous amounts of power to shift things in oneself to open blockages in yourself in your relationship it gives one enormous amounts of perspective the world out there is very complicated <laughs> the little youngsters are behind mummy having a little fight the world out there is very complicated and we feed into that complicatedness as much as we choose to coming out in a wilderness experience where you can completely digitally detox you can start to really assess and realize what it is that's important for you what it is that you want to move forward with any what a start to the day indeed and as discussing last night with the harvest moon i suggested to many of you out there i know many people are doing a lot of work in their relationships a lot of work with regards to their livelihood but it now is a good time to do a lot of work for yourself spend time in nature for yourself if you can take your family there as well great but spend time with yourself in nature every day <laughs> reflecting on what it is that you need to do if you need to do a downward facing dog as an elephant you must do it <laughs> so I invited everybody last night to, to ooh, make some notes and write down a few things that they want to do for themselves moving forward because there's no time like the present not when the kids are out of school when we sell the house when i get that job that could that could just delay and delay and when that does happen then there's another delay and another delay so take it upon yourself to do the things you want to do for yourself right now right now it's no time like the present everybody i didn't invent that phrase it's a very well used phrase and there's no time like the present moment the moment in which we are breathing and engaging connecting and elephants are constantly present constantly in the moment for enormous feet grounded on the earth And although they are community moving as community they are also individuals within that community not lost so stand out in amongst your community do the things you need to do for you stop putting them off stop putting them off for another time exactly Harry that is exactly the point there are so many personalities in this herd in your circle of friends who wants to be normal I want to be I want to stand out and be someone different and no one wants to do exactly the same thing so it's important for us to understand what we want I don't have kids so I don't know the difficulties of it but we do need to live for our kids but we need to live for ourselves as well find connection with the self find connection through nature if you're struggling to find connection with yourself I implore you to get outdoors take your shoes off and put your bare feet on the floor hug a tree I've been getting lots of pictures sent to me of people hugging trees and I so appreciate it the family whole family there was a whole lot of them hugging a massive redwood tree in America and it was huge 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 it took a whole family and they still couldn't even hug the whole tree so thoroughly enjoy those pictures and images coming back and <laughs> breathing with bare feet in nature is where I choose to be
Explorers, we want to hear from you. How crazy is that? Join us on the 11th of September at 8 p.m. for another town hall with the CEO of Wild Earth, Graeme Wallington, where you can give us your feedback on Wild Earth. We want to hear about your Wild Earth experience and answer any questions that you may have. Come along for the catch-up and give us your insights. And remember to sign up if you aren't already an explorer. What a fascinating morning and night last night in terms of all the cat movements. We can't believe how many different cats we've seen. So the lines we had, the first one was the S8 male. I've never seen him with a limp on the front right before, so that was interesting for us. And the second one, the second one was the Kruger male. The first time for myself and Gert meeting him. Very big boy, very beautiful. So thank you very much to everybody that helped us identify those two. It's no wonder we were confused. What is going on? If you didn't get an update on the leopard movements, which I'm sure Steve gave you, and Zutini was on dam cam last night and she came up past camp. Columba and Shadulu were obviously together and there were tracks of male in the area. So we had four different leopards all in the area of quarantine yesterday and last night. And now we've got the Kruger male who was part of a coalition that hasn't been seen in a while, but he is the, the head of the Torchwood Pride. Our Torchwood is just on our right hand side, Jim and now on our left. We're on the cut line and we're going back towards Biffleshook cut line because they lost him in Biffleshook. And it would make sense that he would possibly be pushing back east to Torchwood. So we're going to check the boundary for any fresh tracks coming through in case he looped back. And then we're going to check and see maybe he's coming back along the cut line and we might get him one more time to have another look at such a beautiful big male. Now I don't have any information about the Kruger male as of yet other than being the head of the Torchwood Pride and not having seen the coalition in a while. But I'm definitely going to be doing some research on that. Best believe that will be my day today. I'll be looking up the Kruger male and his coalition and trying to find out what happened to S8 male's paw. He was walking okay on it, just a bit of a limp, kind of similar to Dark Mane, a bit of a limp on the front right. So many things happening, so many things. We did have a quick loop past Bithlesuk Dam, but there was nothing there other than the normal Egyptian geese and blacksmith lapwings, not even a hippo, and that's okay. I do see 
some impalas. I see. Oh, is that a giraffe? Yes. There are giraffes. All right, they are quite close to Professor Cup. Yay! So many things today. A great start to a Sunday. Oh, I think they're in the road. Mandy is, oh, it's, I think this is two young males that are practicing necking. I'm gonna just edge forward slowly. I don't wanna get too close in case they move off. <clears throat> Mandy, not that we are aware of. We don't think there are any white lines in the Sabi Sand Nature Reserve. Most of them are in the Timbavati area. Ngala, Timbavati, that wilderness block. So a little bit further north. That is what we know. We don't even have a confirmation of how many there are because it seems like they may have found a couple more. But this is just a little reminder for everybody that those white lines are completely natural wild white lines. So that's just from the prides in the area carrying that recessive gene. And when two lions with the recessive gene mate and they have little ones, then those cubs have a chance of being white if they get the recessive gene from each parent. They have to get it from both. And so you can imagine how shocked everyone was to have wild white lions all of a sudden popping up, being born. Amazing, isn't it? Hello, you two. There's quite a big size difference between them. <laughs> a little bit of a cuddle after a bit of a play fight. And the one on the left is definitely a male as well. You can see it from the shape of both of their horns. Very thick horns, very wide in terms of how far they are apart and flat on the top. And it's just two youngsters practicing necking. So this is very typical behavior. Standing with their heads kind of spaced apart but bodies very close together and then they swing the head around bending the neck backwards towards backwards and sideways towards the other male I wonder if they know there's been a lion close by they would have heard them calling Now this will not be a serious fight at all because of the age difference it's just two young bulls that are playing and that playing helps them practice what they need to be doing when they're a bit older i would estimate that this younger one is between oh maybe eight and ten months and the slightly older one is probably just over a year or so a year to a year and a half so still too young to be considered adult and having serious fights Oh, interesting. A little itch on the knee. There is another giraffe somewhere further in, and I'd imagine that is the younger one's mum. Unless this is a very strange bachelor herd with quite a Sharks young one. It's like poetry in motion. They're moving very similarly, facing the same directions. I think they're picking up on the smells of those lines. Wow, look at those long legs. It's a really nice comparison of size. Almost looks like a strange, strange setup for a two-headed giraffe. <clears throat> you can see the older one keeps pushing the younger one with its body, so it's trying to engage in that playing. It's trying to push it and say, come on, come on, it's time to play. It's initiating that play fighting. There's the youngster trying to practice, but very half-heartedly. See how it's lowering its neck, trying to kind of push 
the other giraffe with its head. Olivia, unfortunately for giraffes, no giraffe is too big to be taken by lions. These two are definitely an easier range for lions than a full-grown adult, especially an adult male. So at this size, they are, I wouldn't say an easy meal, giraffe is never an easy meal because they've got a very powerful kick and they can move pretty fast. And for lions, what they need to try and do with a giraffe is either try and trip it up so it falls or they've got to try and jump onto its back to weigh it down and pull the neck over so that the giraffe loses balance and falls down. And that would be much easier with these two, especially the younger one, than it would with an adult giraffe. But there's a pride of lions known as the giraffe pride. They almost exclusively focus on eating adult giraffes. And they've learned that if they chase the giraffes for long enough, they'll find a smooth surface, like a tarred road, for example, because they're in the northern section of the Kruger Park, in the self-dried section. Self-dried section, did I say that? And the giraffes lose grip, they slip. Oh, there's a kudu joining the scene. Hello. This is amazing. Yeah, so lions will just try and jump on the back of a giraffe, as opposed to something like a kudu, you might try and jump on the back, but you can also just weigh it down from biting onto the neck and pulling down. Buffaloes are similar to giraffes, you have to try and get onto their back and try and exhaust them with the weight of a lion. But probably you'd find buffaloes and giraffes are the two most dangerous things that lions can hunt, other than elephants, but it's not very common for lions to hunt elephants. That's why so many injuries and even fatalities occur. A well-placed kick could break a lion's jaw. <laughs> Look how the younger one has braced itself. Wide back legs. So it's trying to plant itself with a better center of gravity. So if the other male does push it too hard, it doesn't lose balance. This is why practicing is so important. There's a third giraffe joining the scene. Maybe this is that very odd bachelor herd of five with two kind of young ones. The third giraffe is just behind those bushes on the left. Can't really see it now, but it might pop out into the road. You can see they're almost missing each other. They're just brushing their heads past each other. So this is more just a practice of the movements. They're not actually trying to hit each other or make contact. It's practicing body positioning and movements and growing a bond. They can be very social animals too. Sammy, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm glad that I am able to make you excited too. There's nothing quite like experiencing something out here. There's no hiding that excitement or sadness or whatever it is at the time. Go ahead. Tristan, Tristan for Tess. Hey, hey Finn, go ahead. Wow, look at that movement.
Copy that. Thanks so much, Tristan. Really appreciate it. Copy that, thank you. Very kind to give us an update on what's happening close to Juma. So what's really cool is with all the different radio channels, if we're close to a cut line, we can call on the other channel where the animals are moving towards and we can say, look, just so you know, we're very close to that cut line if you do want to wait for them to cross the cut line. So that's exactly what Tristan was doing for me there, letting me know that there's lines that might come north, and if they do, he'll let us know. So this is definitely one of the more playful necking incidents that I've seen, or necking play fights. They look like they're genuinely enjoying themselves, and they're quite keen on, on continuing. I love that also, the giraffe on the left just kind of popping its head in. <laughs> Very cool. But if you have any questions or comments for me, or even a story, maybe you have a giraffe necking story, please do share it. We are live. We would love to know these things so we can we can experience what you're experiencing too. You can go to wildearth.tv forward slash questions or just scan the QR code. And then we'll be waiting to hear from you. So normally when big bulls are necking, they stand shoulder to shoulder, so they both face the same way and they try and knock each other's chests, but also the upper legs to try and swipe the leg out. Oh, a third one joining the party. Also a male, this is that little bachelor group with five different aged males together. It's very interesting to see the interaction between them. Oh, beautiful, very handsome, tall, dark giraffe. In fact, it might be the one that is referred to as TDH. Very dark. We know the giraffe in this area are darker than normal. I'm not sure why that is, but... Just see what this guy does. And he's just enjoying those flowers of the Northorn. There's lots of nectar in them. It's good giraffe food in this time of the year when there is not a lot of leaves around. So one of the reasons that the Northorns flower early. Firstly, for themselves to have all the pollinators to themselves, but also in turn it creates some great food for the giraffe. Which gets them through this crucial time in the dry season. There he goes. Let's see what he does. I think he's probably going to try and move to another knobthorn tree. I don't think this is the actual one that we call TDH. The, the, the one we call TDH is, is virtually black, but it could be him. Gonna cross the road just now. <laughs> Stunning.
Well, everybody, guess who's back? Look who's back on the tree, having a nap. She probably wasn't far away at all. Shadulu. Didn't think she would leave the amount of meat that's left behind. Oh, she's eaten enormous amounts of it, but there's still enough meat for the day. I, I guess she'll still be here to, this evening. There's a nice big haunch still on that. On that nyala, there's still the neck and the head. And a branch that precariously is about to fall. And there she is, having a nap. She might turn her head for us shortly, show us her face. I can only assume it's Shadulu still, who's up here. Not someone else who's stolen it from her. If it was another leopard, I think the kill would be finished by now. Hmm, there are some really funky smells though coming from around here. It might be from my wheel. I did drive in some leopard scat yesterday morning on our way to find this scene. And already yesterday morning there were at least two leopard in the area, a young male and a female, and then suddenly Tlalambo was here yesterday afternoon, and then in the evening there was Nzuntini on the dam cam. She went up to quarantine and she seemingly has gone west, probably onto Zoe's, I'm not sure. No one's checked. Where tlalamba has gone, we don't know. Where the male leopard's gone, he's gone north through our camp. And lions in the north. It is just an action-packed morning. And we're coming to you live here from Juma Private Game Reserve where, well, the quintessential leopard shot. As soon as she moves her head, that is. has picked up and is blowing quite strongly. There's definitely some big weather changes happening today. Yeah, well we're going to stay right here as the action unfolds and we're going to send you over to Roth and Amakala. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari from the roaming team. We're coming to you live from the Amakala Private Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape Province of South Africa and we have managed to catch up with male lion. He has just given us an almighty roar and what a way to start the morning. My name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera I've got BK with me. BK in the house. How's it BK and how's it to all of you? 
looking forward to what the day has in store for us. So with a, a start like this, I think we're going to have a fantastic morning, a fantastic sunrise safari, and a fantastic day. Now don't forget this is an interactive experience, so please send through your questions and your comments using the link wildearth.tv forward slash questions, or just merely scan the QR code. Jump on board with us and the largest game drive in the world. So, having an incredible roar like that this morning from this particular male lion. And I think he's probably going to get up soon and walk down towards the thickets. He, he does like doing that. He sort of patrols his territory during the night. Then if we are lucky, we see him in the mornings, but it's normally quite fleeting. And after that, then he heads for the thickets and likes to hide away from us. So... I'm hoping that he does get up and walk and then we can see him nicely and well it just seems like everybody's finding the cats I'm happy that we found this male there is also reports of, a f of females nearby so we'll follow up a little bit later but while we wait and see if this guy gets up let's head you on back to Steve with his spots well she's gotten up and she's moved to the carcass very high up Dion guys need to talk please eh? he's just letting the other guys know that there are people trying to get hold of them in the reserve there is a policy of two vehicles coming in from the east and the west and so as much as I'd love to be giving updates all the time so everybody do you think you know everything there is to know about leopards Shaduli here for example do you think you know everything there is to know well this coming Wednesday yes this coming Wednesday Tristan and myself are going to be having an AMA and ask me anything, ask us anything, on Wednesday at 7.30 after drive for explorers. Give you an opportunity to ask all of those questions that you've been wanting to ask about leopards over the coming years. So head over to wildearth.tv forward slash AMA or scan the QR code to watch. It's on Wednesday actually at 6.40, I do apologize, not at 7.30, 6.40 on Wednesday, straight after the sunset drive. So this past week we were celebrating Leopard Fest. We had a fireside chat to discuss all of that. Tristan himself is going to be in camp with me Wednesday night. So please do Go ahead and watch that. Now that branch is going to break soon, we hope, because it is making it difficult to get this great shot. But I'm poor, I have the potential to reverse in there and make your life a lot easier. Does that sound good? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it.
just going to straighten up a little. Just a little bit on the termite mound bump. And repositioned for you to get that perfect shot. The weekly fireside chat in the Mara have been a joy to be a part of. We have looked at many memorable moments so far. The hyenas were eating one side and the lions were eating on the other side. I've never seen that before. Caught up with our expeditioners. There's just something about being here. And had front row seats to all of our expert hosts' insights. Depending on the seasons, there is something they would particularly go for. Join us for one last Mara fireside chat on the 10th of September. We're going to go past another safari vehicle. There is another safari vehicle there. He's just going to walk past it. So I'm going to quickly turn, folks. So just bear with me. Quickly turn and just give us a view because he is going to disappear down the cliff shortly. So let's just get a view on him before he does because once he does do that, he's pretty much gone. So I won't even bother trying to follow him. We know what he does when he goes down this area and he heads straight for the thickets. So once he disappears, we'll then go look for the females that have also been spotted this morning as well. Just enjoy it as he walks down. What a beauty. Magnificent. I think in a year or so's time, he's going to be an absolute beast. This is only the second time I've actually seen him, but this is the best sighting I've had of him so far. And especially with that roar that he gave us. Wonderful. So I think he's pretty much going to head out of sight now. He might come up on the other side of the ridge there. Then once he drops down, that's him done. We can try and just get a view on him. If I head forward here, BK. Hold on, folks. We just try and get another view. He's not in the thickets yet. So yeah, it's um, it's not a great sighting this the, just now. So let me see if I can get a bu better view for us. But while I try my best for that, let's head you on back to Steve with a better view of Shadulu. Yeah, 
Yes, well, she's woken up. <coughs> she's now climbed to the top of the tree where her Nyala is perched precariously. And she has started to feed once again, now on the neck. She's managed to get quite a, a nice position for her bum there and her two back feet on that branch. Now she can just pick away at that carcass as much as she wants to. The hyenas that were here earlier, we haven't seen them since we've been back. Now for sensitive viewers, it's sometimes not ideal to be watching these sort of things, but it is completely natural. This is a wild leopard who made a natural kill of a wild nyala. Both animals had the potential to, to win or lose the battle. There was no human influence in it at all. And the leopard has hoisted it up the tree where she can feed on it at her leisure. The benefit of doing so, the hyenas can't steal it. It would be very interesting to see a big male lion getting that high up the tree to try and steal it. I think she's looking at some hyenas now. There we go. I see one running off there at the back. She's obviously very interested in any movement. And hyena and leopard have got this long standing battle. I don't think you can see it in port. It's just off down the little path. Mandy, you're going to have to wait for the Ask Me Anything on Wednesday for questions like that. I don't actually know. Tristan is definitely more in tune with um, the, the longevity or the, the oldest bloodlines. So off, offhand? I don't know. But the Juma, Juma leopards have been documented for 20 years. Obviously there are leopards and have been leopards in these areas for thousands of years. But game viewing only really started in the 1960s, 70s. When people first started viewing these animals from vehicles. They weren't relaxed and it was a process. But since then, leopards of the Sabi Sands have become a household statement. Everybody knows the Sabi Sand Wildlife Reserve is the best leopard viewing in the world. In South Africa anyway. Oh, she's worrying that head now. This is when things can fall down. Crunching of bone. position it. She's now crushing its forehead with her jaws licking the blood. The canines help to break it and then the carnassial shear, the side cutting teeth used for breaking into the bone there.
keeps looking off at the movements of hyenas. Any movement catch her attention. Even with a kill, leopards are still known to hunt. If a prey animal just makes himself so freely available, it's not impossible for a leopard to hunt again. Adam, yes, they most certainly do eat the bones if they can break them. There's enormous amounts of nutrients and minerals inside the bone marrow. The hyenas moved on to the predatory landscape by initially being scavengers, being an animal that had the strength to bite and break open bones that the large saber-toothed tigers weren't able to do anything with their large canines able to kill and rip at meat but these enormous carcasses were left on the landscape and it's a well-known fact that hyenas in the Mara can actually sustain themselves off of the remains of carcasses left in the field for months after the animal has died when there are no prey animals available so there's lots of nutrients and calcium inside the bones and leopards will eat as much of the bone as they can obviously they do drop a couple of scraps on the floor um, sometimes the bone shards that they ingest are a little bit too sharp um, they're not able to break them too well with the teeth they do wolf down when they feed taking big gulps of bone fur and meat and uh, every now and again leopards will walk around and eat some fresh grass to in, to force them or to cause them to, to vomit and they'll regurgitate a whole fur ball, lions as well and inside that fur ball you can find all sorts of things that the leopard wasn't and the lion wasn't able to digest. Hyena are able to digest the bone although they probably just chew it all up so it goes in more finely pounded down and they will regurgitate balls of fur. So although Shadulu has plucked the Sinyala very well, she's plucked most of it, there's still lots of fur on there. So she does get a lot of fur in her, her feeding and that will be regurgitated out at some point. She's well and truly into the brain case now. Now, when you have select feeding like a leopard is able to do because they are able to hoist their kill, so they're able to feed at leisure, they'll generally start with either the, the rump or the internal organs. Lions, when they kill as a group, they have no time for selection. They just ingest everything that comes towards their mouth. Bone, fur, blood, intestine, stomach content, it all just, just all goes in. But uh, Shadulu is going to enjoy feeding on the, the remainder of the Sinyala's face because she doesn't waste a scrap.
Right, so uh, nothing to really report yet. Other than it's gonna be a stinker of a hot day. I've already shed it every layer I had, and we can already feel it's probably already about 28 degrees as we speak. So we're gonna be it's gonna be fun, I tell you. Alright, I'm not sure where our leopards have gone to. This is the area where we were tracking yesterday and I've not seen any track yet. I did see some old tracks of a young male leopard. But it wasn't fresh. It's from about two days ago. It's not what we're looking for. So I'm just gonna sort of meander and move around. Going back to the heat, as much as that's very uncomfortable, well, at the moment it's not, but it's going to be. We need the heat to start to create the central, or the, 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 the coastal low pressure, or the inland low that we have. And as soon as the intertropical convergence zone starts moving south, we need the heat. Plus the low pressure system to suck in moisture from the ocean to bring us rain. Without that heat, we will not have rain. So we're going to see this now in the next coming months. It's going to build up, build up, build up, build up. Moisture coming in, heat, heat, heat. Thunderstorms are starting to produce. Sometimes uh, you might get extensive systems like uh, inland lows or cut-off low pressure systems that develops. And that then results in a, a two or three day rain period. It's more like a frontal system. In fact, a lot of the meteorologists reckon that we might actually start getting rain in the last two weeks of September. We might actually, the rain might start, which is earlier than usual. But we'll take it any day. And you're back with Shadulu in the tree. Broad pod albits here. I wonder if she knows that. I don't think she really cares. It's a, it's a tree with a nice elevation, some nice branches. I think she would have liked it to have had a bit more leaf cover. That's probably why she's having a go at the carcass now, because it is going to get very warm again today, like yesterday. And if you missed yesterday afternoon's show, Tess was here with Shadulu and Tlalamba came out of nowhere and they had a little bit of a of an altercation. I didn't see it so I don't know how intense it was. But uh, we then we then spent the afternoon following Tlalamba <laughs> who enjoyed chasing a scrub bear towards an elephant bull and then enjoyed stalking the elephant bull. It was quite something to behold how the elephant actually moved away from her. Very strange. Big elephant bull. Wasn't having anything to do with Lumba. But uh, if you are joining us for the first time this morning, um, Shadulu made a kill of a Nyala female yesterday, early morning or in the night. And uh, she hoisted it and is now busy feeding on its face. So if you're not into that sort of thing, please do look away now. She has removed the entire top jaw and is eating the forehead. So everybody, this evening, the CEO of Wild Earth, Graham Wellington, will be hosting a town hall at 8 p.m. Central African time. This is for those who are Wild Earth Explorers. 
giving you the chance to provide some feedback, suggestions, give any complaints and anything else that you feel could help Wild Earth to shape the product. It's been difficult to respond to every email that comes through, but uh, feedback is always valued. So Wild Earth would encourage you to become part of the Explorer Club so as to give your feedback. Graham will be there to answer any questions you might have and also give you some interesting information of some of behind the scenes stuff going on at Wild Earth. So do head over to www.wildearth.tv forward slash town hall or you can scan the QR code. Mm, that is the tongue now she is pulling. Oh no, what is that that she's pulling? It is a it is the jaw. The lower jaw is being ripped off. Often when we find the remains of animals we could we find the fur or we find the horns. And if you don't find the horns if you don't find the horns then you assume that it was either stolen by a hyena or it was a female because uh, as you can see Shadulu is making quick work of the entire face and she'll eat all of it. The teeth the teeth will um, will not be broken down or ingested. She'll probably drop some jawbone on the floor. But Anna Marie, you want to know if there are some hyenas lurking around and there definitely are a couple. I've seen a couple just skulking around in the background but none of them have made themselves very visible for us to show you but we will show you as soon as they step into the, the light but for now we've got such a great view of Shadulu up this tree that tries to reposition it's just going to make a whole lot of noise so we're going to stay Right, yeah, but there were four hyena this morning. One was definitely ribbon. She's missing the tail. One was Swazi. And the other two, well, quite frankly, I have absolutely no idea. We're not going anywhere, we're going to stay right here and let's head over to Tess who seems to have caught up with some Ellie's. having all the big five luck and the unusual animal luck today. We found a small herd of elephants. I don't know if whether it's the same herd that Steve had or not, but we are close to Spaghetti Junction, Chelapan. And it looks like everybody's moving slowly towards the thickets on the edge of the Mulawati. Hello girl. <laughs> Pike. 
cool. Goodness me, that was quite an intimidation tactic. Now, most of them are behind us already, so I'm going to have to do a bit of a turn. They changed direction. They were almost headed towards a Dukla Chela Pan. And then they decided, nah, we're going to reposition ourselves here. All right, let's go around. So it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, at least seven, six or seven elephants together. So it's a small little herd, but quite beautiful. Always love to spend time with some elephants. Now we'll wait here just because there are quite a few thickets on that side, so I don't want to go all the way around. We'll just see where they go. They might decide to go to Chelapan from here because it is heating up substantially. Go ahead. Yeah, negative. Turn to AFM, she's there at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure. Steve's with her at the moment. So I'm not sure how much of that nyama's left. <laughs> oh, goodness, it has been an interesting morning. I love this little calf. It seems to be throwing its trunk around, which is always a lot of fun. It's definitely the smallest calf in the herd. And still in that age where as it was kind of walking across the road, it put its ears out at us and started flicking its trunk around. The best way for a little elephant to be. Oh, look at that thing. It's still so young. Just a few months old. Doing pretty well with that trunk though. Mesh, go ahead. Wow. This is brilliant. Listen to the sounds of them feeding. The grass is drying out, so this female in front of us here. making quite a noise. Peter, this area is considered to be an open system, so there are fences in the Sabi Sand Nature Reserve, but that separates the animals from the outside world of people. But it is open to the Kruger. It's open to the Kruger National Park, so the animals do move freely and they absolutely will and that's why we have animals like the Kruger male that we saw this morning coming in as head of the Torchwood Pride because the, it is a moving system, it's an open system so they can move as far north or south as they want to within the Kruger National Park. We are in what's considered the Greater Kruger National Park so the added private nature reserves and things like that all along the outskirts of the Kruger Park in many different directions or different sides and that adds on to the greater Kruger National Park area. So those animals should be able to move freely. There are a few that are completely fenced off, but they would be a little bit further west from the Kruger Park. Okay, we are moving into the clearing. So let's try again. I can see there's one or two still coming. So the herd is bigger than we thought. This is the kind of front, the back few are still there. What I'm going to do though is loop around this here female and see if we can get a view of that little one again. There's a little pan here, maybe they'll come here to drink. Or mud wallow if there is any mud left. We did notice that the one on Yala South has been recently used as a mud wallow by elephants, probably last night sometime. Let's see what that little one decides to do. Oh, now the wind is blowing towards us as well. The elephants must be loving this windy weather. It helps keep them cool. You'll notice there's hardly any that are actively flapping their ears. So 
even from here, Peter, to Ngala is an open system. So the elephants we have here might well move through Ngala or Orpen or the Timbavati. It's absolutely brilliant. Well, you're back with us, everybody, in Shudulu, who is well and truly feeding on the face of this Nyala. So I was keen to just read a little poem that came to me many years ago, but has re-entered my field the last few months. And it's all about wilderness. So if you bear with me, a beautiful poem by Ian McCullum. Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a pattern of soul, where every tree, every bird and beast is a soul maker. Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a moving feast of stars, footprints, scales and beginnings? Since when did we become afraid of the night, and that only the bright stars count? Or that our moon is not a moon unless it is full? By whose command were the animals through groping fingers, one for each hand, reduced to the big and little five? Have we forgotten that every creature is within us, carried by tides of earthly blood, and that we name them? Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a season, and that we are in its final hour? It's a beautiful piece of writing by Ian McCullum that resonates very strongly with me introduced to me many years ago by a mentor, Alan McSmith. And it's very, very powerful. She had a, a trail recently where a friend of mine came to do a, his birthday, came for a celebration of his birthday. And he actually brought a poem along, one poem along he wanted to read. <laughs> and I ended up reading this to them on the first night. <laughs> He was flabbergasted because it's the one poem he brought from America to read. <laughs> so synergy, synchronicity, wilderness is not a place. It is a way of life. It is a way of being. 
like this leopard, is wild and free. The Nyala was wild and free as well, and now stains this leopard's legacy. connection with wilderness and with these wild places is so important. We know the benefits it has on the soul. It's well documented and those who visited and spend time out here have experienced it for themselves. So I'm going to commit myself to doing some more writing moving forward, play some more music, write music, play music. I'm going to be accountable for that. What comes up for you in this moment about accountability of something you would like to do for yourself? And tell those around you, tell your loved ones that you'd like to exercise more or you'd like to do this with your diet or you'd like to stop doing that. Amazing how powerful it can be, not only writing it on a piece of paper but telling it to your friends and family. Post it on Facebook if you need to. <laughs> Let the world know your intentions of what you'd like to change or create for yourself and move forward with it. Stacey, it is a beautiful poem. I know, thank you very much for your words. Um, it gives me shivers, actually, whenever I read it. It's very, very well written. And it invokes so much thought. So that's why I bring it forward after our chats earlier with the elephants and the harvest moon. It is still the harvest moon. You know, with new moons, we put down new intentions, but now it's the harvest moon. What can we harvest for ourselves? For ourselves. To harvest for ourselves is not to be selfish, to benefit and improve our own being benefits the beings around us. Hmm, think about that. So, tell your loved ones what you want to be accountable for. I want to write more and play more music. Came up strongly on the men's trail recently. At the end, everybody shared what they'd like to be accountable for. And when you share it with people and you write it down, others can ask you, so, how's it going with that thing you said you were going to do? It might be spend more time with my kids, if you have kids. Spend less time on social media. The wind agrees with my statements. The elements, very powerful, communicate with us, affirm most things. And I do get lots of comments um, from many of the viewers about some of the reflections I put forward and the silent moments. Just remember everybody, these are things you can do on your own. There's many, many techniques and practices out there for bettering oneself.
enjoying quiet moments is a powerful practice. And as always everybody, we are live and interactive and your questions and comments are so welcome. Please do send them through on the website or scan the QR code. So something that popped up for me yesterday was when I loved myself enough, I began leaving whatever wasn't healthy. This meant people, jobs, my own beliefs and habits, anything that kept me small. My judgment called it disloyal. Now I see it as self-loving. Self-loving, everybody. Self-loving. It's the theme of the weekend. Theme of my life now. What I've found through my own experiences is through my own self-loving, it's improving the lives of people around me. Because I don't react to them they don't trigger me. I'm content in myself, so I'm able to give more. Rather than it being a competitive game. When we're not self-loving, we're expecting others to love us. And that becomes an ego battle and a challenge and a difficult thing to do. We are enough. We have enough. Profound affirmations. Like Shadulu, she is enough. She doesn't worry about what others think of her. She has to put down her boundaries every now and again, reaffirm those boundaries, re scent mark them, reclaim them, to let others know this is my space, like she did with Tlalamba yesterday. Oh, here she goes. She carries on with her life. Gilroy, 100%. 100% the bush touches one's soul like nothing else. Wild places where the wild animals still roam freely. I'm truly blessed to find myself in those places. To truly find myself in those places. Do not chase other human beings. Instead, chase your curiosity. Chase your development and your goals. Chase your passion. Strive to work for something bigger than yourself. Instead of trying to convince someone that you fit within their world, strive to build your own. Okay, well, we're going to stay here reflecting on daily lives while we send you out to Tess, who is on the move. Oh my goodness, we are so excited. We've just found a female leopard on Weaver's Nest coming in from the fire break. Are we going to reposition? She's just scent marked on this here glory, so we're about to get some nice popcorn. Oh, is... We don't know who she is yet. My immediate instinct was Lunga, but 
Ah, disappeared already. We'll try our best to follow. But I think she might be a little small for Munga. But I might be wrong. Very tufted ears, that's for sure. Very tufted ears. Uh, let's try up here. Yes, there I can see her. She does seem fairly relaxed. So my immediate instinct was either Lunga or Nzutini. Right here she comes through the lovely sun section. Johan, come in. Okay, another vehicle's just come in. All right, if you have an ID for us on this female leopard, please do let us know. She is quite small, so I'm immediately thinking young female. All right, let's see if we can keep up. This is amazing. Oh. Come on, Mandy. Come on, Mandy. The station's just located on a Mafazi Ingwe going west, just north of the fire break west of Weaver's Nest. <laughs> Please do, no worries, we hadn't even had a chance to call it in yet. Okay, so Shreyas, you think that it is Lunga. Thank you so much. That was my immediate instinct as we bumped her. Hello Lunga. And it, we literally met at the junction as we were coming off the fire break. She was coming onto Weaver's Nest and we literally met in the corner at the junction and got, got, a, got a leopard fright. A rosette surprise. What is happening with all of these cats recently? Isn't that amazing? So I wonder if she's investigating because there's been Zutini, Lumba, Shidulu and a male. She's now the fifth leopard fairly close to quarantine area. I can see her there. I just want to see where she's going to go. She's currently kind of searching, sniffing into the wind. There she's standing on the base of this bush willow. Probably investigating all of the sounds. If she keeps going this way, she's gonna pop up at Treehouse Dam. Now we know there were tracks of a female leopard at Treehouse Dam. There were tracks of male and female crossing south into Hoffmans as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was in Zutini with a male. Maybe it was Lunga with a male. Hey Firm Lunga. Our little Miss sunshine so just in the last 24 hours we have had now five different leopards in the same area or a similar area oh not the easiest for you but look at her scratching those claws so this feels good for her. It keeps the claws nicely maintained, but it's also a way of scent marking and showing her playfulness. But the fact that she was scent marking on that quarry bush as we got here as well, amazing. Let's do it 101. <laughs> very interesting name. Uh, when leopards mate it doesn't always catch immediately but if it does catch and they do become pregnant then it is almost immediate. So it does take a few days obviously for the body to sink into the reality that yes there is there is the potential of cubs in there um, but that obviously just takes a while for the body itself to react to. I'm hoping there's not a log here. So essentially, oof, it 
just takes a little while for the body's hormones to start changing because the immediate reaction is as soon as the sperm has kind of contacted the egg if it takes or eggs if it takes then immediately the hormones start changing and that just takes a little while for the leopard's body to take used to but it does happen if it is successful within the first few days she is stalking something look how flat she is in the grass you can't even see her anymore that is unreal. She's using that log as cover. Now, Johan, she's definitely interested in something. Wow. This is where that camouflage is so mind-blowingly perfect. Let's just see what she's going to do. I'm having a scan. I can't see any prey species around, but maybe she can hear a bird or something. I don't see impalas or a steenbuck or a dica. But she has moved forward a little bit. Isn't that impressive how good that camouflage is? You can't see her anymore, but I know she's there. <laughs> We're going to reposition. We don't want to move in front of her now that she is interested in something. We want to move around the back. Because if we move in front of her, we're giving advantages away. So we're going to move around this way and give it a bit of a lap or a loop. the little bush willow is going to pop back up. Wow, this is cool. <clears throat> but that's why I was wondering yesterday with Shidulu as well, could that excessive salivating not just be because of the heat, but also, oh, she's coming out here, also potentially because of a pregnancy? Could that be a thing? I've never considered that before, never noticed it in a pregnant leopard before, but then again, how do we know when a leopard is pregnant unless we see her with suckle marks or a very heavy belly? She has stopped stalking. Let's just see where she goes. She looks like she's going to go just behind us. I'm just going to let her pass before I reverse because if I reverse then I'm cutting her off. So let me just let her move and then I'll reposition and she is right behind her now. How excited. Okay, yeah, there we go. She's moved enough. There she comes, look. Isn't she amazing? Amazing. Alright, she's moving straight into the block. It's a very big block from here to the next road. <laughs> I don't think I heard that name correctly, did you, G? Lenor, maybe? I think it sounded like Lenor. I'm wearing the lucky hat, not the lucky socks. Lucky hat alone today, no lucky socks. I don't like to wear the long socks when I'm wearing three quarter pants. I only like to wear the long socks when I'm wearing long pants. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm particular about that. <laughs> but the lucky hat is always up. Ah, Vielo, thank you so much. Yes, I like to wear the long socks when I'm wearing long pants. Thick block. Around the back of a termite now. Warthog hole, elephant hole, one of the two. Very, very dug out area. Let's go through here and see. Right, she's right in front of us now. And at this rate, she's moving straight towards the area of Treehouse Dam. pretty girl standing perfectly to try and <laughs> hide a bit of her face <laughs> all 
God, we're going to have to wait here and just see where she goes. There is a third vehicle joining as well, so we're just going to see how she goes from here. If she does keep going through this block, we'll try and keep up as best we can. Maybe she's going to come out into a few open clearings. But it is going to get harder and harder to follow her, so let's just see what happens. Maybe I should wear my lucky socks this afternoon to prevent the sunburn and the heat of today. Today is supposed to get up to 37 degrees Celsius. Yesterday was 35. So we're going to get even hotter. Wendy is incredibly impressed with her capabilities, don't you think? of us again. Right, it's just here. Yeah. It's quite tough to get a visual. All right. So she is just in front of us again and still moving. She looks like she is sniffing the air. She's almost going straight north now. So let's just see what happens. Explorers, we want to hear from you. How crazy is that? Join us on the 11th of September at 8 p.m. for another town hall with the CEO of Wild Earth, Graham Wallington, where you can give us your feedback on Wild Earth. We want to hear about your Wild Earth experience and answer any questions that you may have. Come along for the catch up and give us your insights. And remember to sign up if you aren't already an explorer. She's climbed down the tree. She's gone in there. Poor, I can actually just see her back. Just see her back. This is probably where she was this morning. Just see her back over there. It's not a great shot, but we've got someone over here. 
is also gonna hide. I'm gonna hide now. It's gonna hide. I don't, can you see her back there? Yeah. There she is. There's the spots. Just, uh, it's nice and cool down there in the drainage. She'll be here all day long. What a morning. So I'm guessing the tracks I had around Treehouse Dam, those of um, Langer then, I can't be sure. They are Leopards everywhere at the moment, it seems. So it is my father's birthday today. Happy birthday, Dad. Wishing you a blessed Sunday with the family at home. That is a very full and hot leopard that's going to be right there until she decides to eat again. And uh, please, everybody, do, <laughs> do your questions and comments using the website or scanning the QR code. We're probably going to move out as it is baking down on us now, and there's no shade where we find ourselves. Even the hyenas that were in the area have decided to scuttle into the shade. Shadulu's in the shade. So I'm guessing the wise choice, boys, to go find some shade. What do you reckon? That's the wise choice. Wise choice, indeed. So now if I, and Paul just pulls the camera back from that angle, hold her in your eyes, everybody. Can you see her? Can you still see her? Can you still see her? Gone. That is the disruptive camouflage that is the leopard's ability to disappear into the smallest amount of vegetation. So much so that if you're moving, you might not even see them. Let's go see if Chris has ever walked past or driven past a sleeping leopard. Yeah, it certainly sounds like there's a leopard fest again at Juma. Um, I'm driving now towards uh, a little bit of the south around Buffalo Pan. This is the area where the dogs were seen last. So we will uh, we will try and see if there's not enough, anything on them. No reports of their tracks. And I'm suspecting they might be somewhere in this valley. But you know dogs, they get up and they move and they move long distances. Well, we had those buffalo this morning. I am foreseeing a challenge this afternoon because everything's going to be lying down so if you know exactly where a lion or a leopard is that's good that's good that's good um, unless you don't if you don't know where they are exactly they're going to be flat in shade so we have a challenge for the afternoon to try and find stuff because it's especially here it's going to be a hot day hotter the hottest day so far. Uh, since the start of spring. Also gonna have to layer up on sunscreen because the UV index is a very high today. Actually borderline dangerous. So I'll have to just make sure I've got a couple of layers of sunscreen on this afternoon. And I can even now feel the sun is pinging, and it's not yet that hot. I think it's probably about 31 degrees now. I can already feel the sting, it's, it's there. It's 
sink. Yeah. Buffalo pan's dry, so as far as the water is concerned, it's not something that will attract anything at the moment. But it's along the drainage, so the foliage in the drainage might attract prey animals, which could attract things like leopard and so forth. Hi there, Jade. I love that question. Jade wants to know how do I, and I assume us as guides, handle a situation where we're going into summer, you know, we don't see any animals on a game drive or a bushwalk, whatever that may be. Jade, and that's where guiding comes in. All right, so m much like what we do with the tracks and stuff. There's so much more to experience out in the bush than animals. So in that case, we will be trying to still create an experience by looking at trees, ecology. And that's where your skill as a guide comes in. And it takes a while to, to get the hang of that. Because you can go out and just chat about a track. Oh, this is in a track, that, that, that. But if there's a story involved, you know, tell stories. But it can be challenging because the expectations of a lot of the guests is Right, they come to Africa, they want to see the animals, especially things like the big five and the more iconics or, or you know, or high profile species. And if they're not around due to the heat or whatever conditions it may be, you're going to have to revert to the smaller things until such time that you can find the bigger stuff. It all comes down to experience, um, training, and a bit of luck. I've had a countless occasions where that has happened, where there's just no animals. We have seen it on, on Safari Live as well, where there's days where, you know, it's just nothing happens. Thing is, the bush is full of other things that are equally as entertaining and interesting than just the big animals best way for a guide is to start to incorporate those little things as part of your story narrative with guests as part of the you know almost look at creating a necklace with pearls and some pearls are bigger than others and the little small pearls are the ones in between the big pearls and then the chain that links them all together is your narrative your guiding narrative and skills to link them all together and tie them up into an actual necklace because if you just hand somebody a hand of pearls ah, it's cool it's nice it's pearls so all of those things work together as an overall experience so if you as a guide start off early in this safari and incorporate the small things link them to the bigger things and you will be okay right let's go over to Tess and see what she's up to interesting topic of conversation there Chris I suppose there's many ways to do it and it depends guide to guide as guest to guest so we have left the lovely Lunga more like she left us <laughs> she moved straight through the very thick thickest of the thick monkey orange sections on the western side of Weaver's Nest south of Treehouse Dam so we figured Treehouse Dam is a good place to try our luck and see if she pops out so while we're taking in some uh, some hippo scenery, we'll be hoping that Miss Lunga comes back to find us again like she did this morning. I thought it was very kind of her to pop out at the same junction as us completely by chance. Can't even claim we tracked her. I would like to see if the hippo has a friend again, or is hippo on its own? The breeze up here is beautiful. If 
for now it seems like the hippo is on its own. I haven't seen anything else pop up. I'm going to reposition myself and see if I have a better chance of viewing. A little higher up. It does look nice and calm here. I can hear magpie shrikes. Can see the odd dove and forktailed drongo and starling. Very nice and calm. A good place for Lunga to come and have a little drink if she so decides. So we're going to be patient and see if she decides to pop up. She was zigzagging quite a bit, so definitely aware of her surroundings, but potentially also looking for something to eat. She did look like she had quite an empty stomach, but I'm sure she's also fascinated by all of the smells in the area. Zucchini, Lalamba, Shidulu, a male, who knows who the male is, maybe tortoise pan, maybe Mulwati. Maybe even someone smaller. Have a look at those ripples on the water. Impressive, isn't it? And look how chocolate brown it is. It's a treehouse dam has gotten quite a bit dirtier with this wind being so severe because it's blowing a lot of um, water, I mean dirt into the water. It's also causing a bit of the silt at the bottom to circulate with these ripples. So it's definitely gotten a bit dirtier, but I'm glad it's still so full. I think we've had an exceptional start to our Sunday with all the different cats, but it also means because it is Sunday, tonight is our town hall with our CEO, Graham Wallington. So if you don't know what a town hall is, it's where you have the opportunity to come along and have a chat with Graham. The town hall's purpose is to get your feedback. So whether you think there's something that we're doing really well, maybe something we could do a little bit better to help enhance your experience with us at home, please do come along to the town hall tonight. You can give us that very valuable feedback. We really do appreciate it. You do need to be a Wild Earth Explorer to join the town hall and give us that feedback. So you can go to w, uh, oh, www, no, you can go to wildearth.tv forward slash town hall or you can scan the QR code if you want to find out more about how you can give us your feedback during the town hall tonight. That'll be at 8 p.m. Central African time. Today, Sunday the 11th. We are looking forward to hearing from you. Did notice a bat of air flying over earlier, but it seems to have disappeared. Oh, I see the giraffe. <laughs> a beautiful big giraffe. We are having a giraffe's kind of day. Giraffes, spots, cats, all the things. Perhaps already had a drink. Maybe you missed the giraffe. Looks like it's quite fascinated though, looking straight into the wind. Towards Shibamu Track area. Philemon's cut line. Okay, so things are pretty quiet at Treehouse Dam. I have a feeling Lunga is still quite a ways away the way she was zigzagging. So I think what we're gonna do is slowly drive up north, up Taxon's Road. The giraffe is disappearing as well. So let's see if we can find anything on Taxon's Road. Maybe Lunga has changed her mind since she was changing direction so frequently. She zigzagged her way to the drainage line on the right and crossed that already. We haven't heard alarm calling, we haven't heard even birds sounding upset, so I doubt she's coming this way. I think she changed her mind again. It's 
Probably one of the most underestimated things coming on safari is how much the wind can dry you out. It works exactly the same for the animals. It's not just the heat, but the wind. The wind causes you to dry out, and so on windy days, animals might have to drink a little bit more frequently as well. So even if it's not the hottest day, if it's a windy day, it's still worth checking water holes. But on a hot and windy day, it is definitely worth checking water holes. So we got a little bit lucky there with the giraffe. Maybe Lunga will only pop up there a bit later. Goodness me, the elephants have definitely been rearranging some of the furniture. And a little update for you, the hyena den seems to be inactive today. I think it's too windy. And on top of that, I think with the combination of the heat and all of the other predators that have been moving around, perhaps the cubs are not as willing to be social today. Five different leopards, lions on the southern side of Gauri Main, maybe just a bit overwhelming for the hyena clan today. It's all about the shade, it's all about staying cool today and when you're as small as the smallest antelopes that we find in this area, you find whatever shade you can find. Now let me know when you see it, let me know when you spot the little animal. There he is. Now, little Steenbok male here has been feeding for 20 minutes and then we'll sit in the shade and ruminate for 20 minutes and then we'll continue that cycle day and night. They don't stop. They, they feed, they chew, they feed, they chew. Now when, you say, when I say the word feed and chew, it falls under two different categories of course. When you are a ruminant animal, not like a leopard who just wolfs down everything and bones and all, Ruminants go out there with their shopping bag, so to speak, and collect and forage on the vegetation they would like to process. They collect it all, they put it in their bag, and then they go find themselves some shade, and then they sort it out. It's something that, that humans uh, did. We'd harvest things and then go and sort it out in the shade. So ruminants essentially do that, except they use their mouths and they might put a slight amount of saliva on each little plant part that they collect before swallowing into the first bag being their rumen, the first chamber of their stomach and then they can do that. Steenbox do it for 20 minutes very selective mouth parts, very selective feeding they'll then go and sit in the shade like this fellow is doing for 20 minutes chewing and chewing and chewing. Everybody <laughs> Everybody's wishing my dad a very happy birthday. Well, Jonathan Falconbridge, I hope you are watching. That uh, all of the audience is celebrating your birthday with you. And if any of you are also celebrating your birthday today, I wish you well. So the Steenbok goes through those bouts of feeding and chewing, feeding and chewing constantly. And it's one of the benefits of being a ruminant in that you can go and spend some time in the shade when the conditions are warm, like this. But unfortunately, young fellow, it's going to continue to be warm like this all day. And uh, I wonder if he knows that Shadulu is 100 yards from him right now. hundred yards is not very far but when you're as camouflaged as a steerbok I mean we Paul didn't see him when you drove past I just noticed this little couple of sticks sticking out ears are flat listening blending in beautifully with the environment
No, I don't think so, Sarah. The full moon is the full moon. And if anything, um, what does happen around full moon is because it's so bright, um, it's difficult to hunt because animals can see them. I mean, they're all out and about regardless. But uh, something might be going down. There's, there's territorial shifts that are happening. And uh, what we do find a lot on full moon, due to the fact that animals can't hunt efficiently due to the abundance of light, is that you'll find animals being quite territorial and moving around, demarcating, claiming. You know, if you can't hunt, you might as well at least demarcate your territory. And while they're on those demarcation routes and um, rituals, they will hunt if they can. They will indeed hunt if they can. But we find on very windy, dark nights that our cats are very good at hunting. When the moon is full, you even have birds calling. We can see at night. We can see quite well at night. So we just get days and nights when there's a lot of action and days and nights when there's very little action. And the fact that there's lots of cats moving around indicates to me that there's lots of hungry cats. Shadulu didn't leave the scene. I think she was there the whole time. We just couldn't find her. There was no tracks coming out of the block that we could find, not saying that there weren't. She drank yesterday. Calling all Wild Earth Explorers, we have a brand new prize for you to win. The lucky winner will jet off to the magnificent Amakala, where Lauren and the Wild Earth Roaming crew have spent the last two months for an incredible three nights stay for two at the Shossi Game Lodge. Unwind, surrounded by the natural music of the wild, and enjoy daily safaris from an open vehicle. Sign up to be an explorer before the 14th of September, and you could be heading off to this unforgettable safari.
themselves Wild Stephen and Paul. In reality though, we are coming up this way to see if there might be anything around this area where there were three sets of female trucks, one set of male trucks and all the different leopards. And you have to see what we're dealing with right now because it's very unusual. <laughs> Do you notice anything strange about this herd of herbivores? I wonder. I don't think I've ever seen so many faces and ears crammed into one patch of shade. <laughs> the poor things have found a patch of shade from a cluster leaf and they are literally just trying to get themselves as close to the center of that patch of shade as possible. Look at that sea of ears and faces. There are very few impalas outside of this little bubble. And it's not the greatest patch of shade. Some of them are still in the sun, but they're trying. They're trying hard. It's getting super hot. Some nice young males, the yearlings just about from last year. Just a sea of impala faces. From a distance, it's tough to tell one apart from the other. Now the ones in the middle are lucky because they're being protected by the other impalas, not only as a food source, but as wind barriers too. They've also got the best patch of shade. The ones on the outskirts are still kind of half in the sun, so they've positioned themselves very carefully with their sides to the wind to try and get the maximum airflow over the body with the largest kind of side surface area wise to the wind and they're hopefully their smallest side to the sun. So the sun is hitting down the back, but the wind is hitting kind of from the side so that they've got a bit of, bit of a double wind there. But I just think it's very interesting to see so many impalas crammed into one little spot. The rest of the herd is slowly starting to amble towards the rest of the shade. One by one, the odd impala is leaving this patch of shade, taking the leap of faith through the sun to move to the next patch. Laura Cam, thank you so much. It is an absolute pleasure, as usual. It has been a stellar sunrise safari, and I think with such a hot day lined up, we couldn't have asked for better. So much cat action, so much giraffe action, elephants. We really just had it all today. Even some very bundled up impalas, unusual to see. Ah, one by one, we're taking the leap, walking into the sun. So you'll probably find these impalas are weighing up, okay? I've got to feed a bit, I've got to move around, but I've also got to find the shade. So they're spending a bit of time in the shade and then moving and feeding at the same time and then going to the next patch of shade. And I can already see them congregating in the next patch in front of us. So they're literally doing shade hopping and in between they'll stop briefly to feed. And here's the next patch of shade from another set of silver cluster leaf trees. congregating again so literally hopping from one patch to another that's exactly what we will be doing this afternoon with it expected to get so hot today we will be shade hopping as well we'll probably be trying our best to stay in the breeze too but this is a really cool literal animal description of what we do on hot days and what they do as well which is why we like to shade hop because they like to shade hop it's also like we also how and why we like, there we go, that's the sentence I was looking for. Also why we like to waterhole or dam hop, because the animals do too. Got to try and keep yourself 
protected from such hot and windy conditions it can dehydrate you quite quickly. I think we really got exceptionally lucky today, starting with calling lions that were moving and how cool that myself and Khar got to meet the Kruger male for the first time and see the S8 male, I haven't seen him in ages. Very cool way for us to start our morning, but then also having Shidulu, also having Langa, having the giraffes in between, I think, and elephants, you know, all around, even from Chris, we've had such an exceptional morning. Thank you very much to everybody that joined us on safari this morning. Thank you for your questions and comments as well. We really appreciate those interactions. It helps us get to know you as you get to know us and the bush. We are going to be out again this afternoon, the usual 2.30 p.m. Central African time. Hopefully you'll be there with us as well. But if you are wanting to keep it wild for the rest of the day, please just, you know, come and join in with Escape to Nature. It is straight after the sunrise safari. It's just a nice chance to keep that wild element going throughout the day. We're definitely looking forward to seeing what this afternoon holds. I think the intense heat is going to be a little bit of a challenge, but we're going to take it as we normally do. Thanks again, everybody, wherever you are. Have a lovely day. Have a lovely evening. We'll see you all a little bit later. And thanks for joining us on the adventure.